Good evening. I'm Dr. Fred Rouse, the Real Money Doctor, and it's currently just a few minutes before 7 o'clock on Friday, July 17th. And I want to do uh, today's daily recap of events that affect your ability to get, protect, and enjoy your money, your life, and your retirement. Now, the question for today is, it's Friday. Have you had enough? And I'll get to that in just a few minutes. And where we start every show is just touching base on the current COVID situation, because again, that's the largest thing that's been affecting the U.S. and most of the world, at least most of the world, most of the year. And the U.S. definitely, okay, in the last uh, six and a half months or so, there's been nothing else in the news other than that for all intents and purposes. So right now, the current number of COVID cases is 3,627,000. Okay, that's up about 70.6,000 since yesterday. Total number of cases that have recovered is about 30%. And of the total number of cases at 36,000, 3 million, uh, 627,000, about 4.05% of those people have actually died. So this is not the, the, the 0.01% flu or anything like that. This is uh, progressed and it's taken a lot of lives. In fact, so far to date, uh, 138,988 people have died so far. Uh, that's up another 800, almost 50, not quite, uh, people have died overnight since we spoke yesterday. Now, New York State has the largest number of cases at 400,000, uh, 405,000 actual cases. Um, they're up basically 769 cases or so since yesterday. Their deaths have not in increased that much. Their total number of deaths right now in that state is 32,000. 452. So only six people have died um, in New York State since yesterday. So their numbers are coming down, uh, which is novel. For not everybody can really say that. California State is the second highest in number of cases right now. Not the most activity, but the most cases. And again, right now, there are 365,000 cases. They're up 9.6 thousand cases since yesterday, and 707,491 people have died. That's up another 115 from yesterday. Florida's got the number three spot. Uh, Texas is number four. Florida and Texas are big movers, and we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. Uh, New Jersey's got number five. Illinois has number six. Arizona was a big mover so far this year, this month. Major things are happening out there in Florida, and we'll touch base in a couple minutes. On uh, but they're number seven. Georgia's number eight. Massachusetts is number nine, and Pennsylvania has been the number ten spot for at least most of this month or so. Now, there was a time in the United States when forty thousand coronavirus cases in a day would seem like an absolutely alarming milestone. That was just less than three weeks ago. Right now, okay, the number of new infections reported each day is reaching absolutely astounding levels. On Thursday, U.S. caseload topped 70,000 for the first time. The total number of cases is one thing, and New York and California really lead in that. However, it's the rate, it's the rate of the increases in the cases and the deaths that is the single most alarming thing right now. And the numbers of COVID cases uh, and fatalities were reported in Florida, Texas, South Carolina on Thursday. Record numbers in those states. 39 states reported an increase in the numbers of new cases from just the week before. California, Florida, Arizona, and Texas have become states with surging caseloads. And they're concerned about their hospital bed situation at this point in time. They're going to have shortages very shortly. Now, for five consecutive days now, Florida has led the nation in coronavirus cases per capita. And that's the equalizing factor, basically, when you look at everybody, because the states are different, but per capita. So currently, Florida is averaging about 55 cases per 100,000 people, according to information from John Hopkins University. And that's where we collect most of their numbers from. Florida took over the number one hotspot for the rising cases from Arizona. They did it on Monday. Arizona had really held the top spot for over a month right now 
and the, the rate of increase of cases that they had. Okay. Um, they dropped a third right now behind Louisiana. Okay. Um, the main, okay, main floor of the uh, Florida's Emergency Operations Center in Tallahassee, okay, where they conduct everything out of, it's been emptied out for cleaning and is closed until Monday after 12 workers in the emergency center, the emergency operating center, 12 workers in one spot tested positive. Yeah. Uh, the Miami-Dade mayor said some hospitals have really begun to operate more ICU beds than they would normally operate. And you wonder how could that happen? Really happen? I mean, you only have X number of beds. Well, for that to happen, it means you're pulling in non-ICU spaces and you're doing makeshift things to try and deliver a type of care in a non-ICU setting that would normally be delivered in ICU. That requires a lot of work. You have a lot of monitoring equipment there and ICUs are set up in a very, very specific way with that equipment and the alarms and so you can see the patients. And anytime that you're doing anything outside of that, okay, it generally doesn't work out well for the patients or the staff. It's, there's a certain design that goes into ICUs um, for best practices so everybody can actually take care of everybody. And when you're trying to pull in beds from other places, okay, it just doesn't work out really well at all. You don't sit to see the patients, okay, the alarms are different, okay, you're doing makeshift things, and it just, it doesn't work out well. You know, in, in Texas, and uh, Bexar, Bexar County, okay, where San Antonio is located, okay, they started securing refrigerated trailers to store bodies until they can be released to a funeral homes. And it's the same thing they were doing in New York, and you remember those, those videos of that, okay, right outside the hospital, you had these refrigerated trucks, and the mortgagers couldn't take them, and they were stacking them up in the refrigerated trucks. They're doing the same thing in Texas right now. In camera and uh, I think it's Hidalgo counties in Texas, they're sharing a large refrigerated, refrigerated trailer to store bodies of coronavirus patients because of lack of space in the morgues and the hospitals there. Now, the Dallas County morgue also had to use external refrigerated truck this week due to the increased caseload. Now, outside of the totally absent, ineffective, okay. Um, coordinated federal response. There's an ever growing number of things that are really contributing to the problem right now. Lacking test results is one of the biggies. States depend on testing data to make crucial decisions on reopenings and on resources. But that data is lagging as testing sites are just getting backed up considerably. And again, you saw this this past week. Some people are waiting in line for 13 hours. And by the time they get there, they're out of materials. What a surprise. Tests are being done on a much larger volume, and that, that's true, okay? And that's really a good thing. But the increase is also slowing down the results. Now, the commercial labs are backed up. Right now, their results are taking as long as seven days. Sometimes it's 10, just to turn around with the results. Now, with 700 to 800,000 people being tested each day, that means it could be a week before officials really know how many of them are actually infected. That means those folks are out and about, and if they're infected, they're just spreading the infection. And if there was, if there was any effective contract tracing, okay, and there's not, you also can't do contract tracing until you know who's actually infected. And then in this tragic comedy of errors and missteps, people are still having a debate about masks. Some states still struggle, struggle to try and tame the virus, and the debate just rages on about wearing face coverings, and they're going crazy about it, absolutely crazy. Now, excuse me, Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, okay, he recommended him, but then when the mayor um, of Atlanta, uh, with, uh, Keisha Bottoms, I believe her name is, on Thursday, okay, required face masks, he sued her. Okay, he's got a lawsuit going now. So 
the mayor accused Kemp of playing politics and wasting taxpayer money with the suit. What prompted the suit? I don't know. I wasn't there. However, however, uh, President Trump visited Atlanta earlier this week. Okay, He was at the airport there, and the mayor pointed out that he was breaking city law by not wearing a mask. Is that any coordination? I don't know. You can leave that to your own thoughts. In Utah, a public meeting about a mask policy was abruptly canceled when people without face coverings just packed into the room. The crowd booed and the whole meeting was called off. This is the exact opposite of what we need to be doing, according to a Utah County Commissioner who was at the actual meeting in the Provo at the time. Now, we're supposed to be physical, physically distancing and wearing masks. This gathering violate, violates current health recommendations. What a surprise. Now, the governor of uh, Colorado, uh, Jared Polis, he told CNN on, uh, today that he used the data to implement a statewide mask mandate for public indoor spaces. Um, we care about our economy and saving lives, and we need to learn from our cities and our counties that lead the way and mask wearing uh, in the economy right now. That's what he said. Now, yesterday, Paul announced that the residents must wear masks where they're, whenever they're in a public space, that they're indoors and are not able to social distance. That order went into effect at midnight. Now, businesses, businesses want the mask mandate so they can safely do business. This is not a surprise here, people. Okay, everybody's complaining about these masks. Okay. Doctors have been wearing them for years in the ERs. You go to a dentist, would you want to breathe it into your face without a mask on? No. Is the mask there to protect him from you? No, it's to protect you from him. Things haven't changed. Now, a top corporate lobbying group renewed calls for a consistent federal and state guidelines on safety measures, including face coverings. Now, the Business Roundtable said it's lobbying for those mandates since April. According to a press release, the group chaired by Walmart CEO, Doug McMillan, okay, represents the CEOs of America's biggest companies, major companies, including Target, CVS, the grocery chain Publix, Walmart, Kroger, Kohl's, will all be requiring customers at their US stores to wear masks. Now, an unpublished document prepared for the White House on okay, Coronavirus Task Force says that 18 states are in the coronavirus red zone, and those states should actually roll back their measures amid surging cases. Now, the red zone is defined as areas that, during the last week, reported both new cases above 100 um, per 100,000, 100 per 100 in population, per 100,000 population, and the diagnostic test positivity of over 10%. So you need both of those things to be considered in the red zone. More than 100 cases per 100,000 people, and of the cases above 10% impact positive. Georgia is among 18 of those states in the red zone. Okay. And there's 11 more. In any situation, especially like we're in right now, the free flow and access of the most current information is critical for everyone in the policymaking stream, as well as the public. Now, totalitarian regimes cut off information and news sources so no one really knows the facts about what's going on in any given situation. It's a hallmark of what they do. It's happened countless times over the centuries. It's in every history book. Open a book today, and the U.S. is there right now. The administration this week directed hospitals and states to stop reporting their COVID numbers to the CDC and instead report them to directly to a private contractor. Now, on the eve of when this new system was supposed to take into effect, the data just disappeared from the CDC center disappeared from their websites. 
as households began filing their COVID information to a private contractor. CDC stuff just disappeared. A day later, okay, a major, major outcry from other federal health officials. And they're really upset with the Trump administration. And the Trump administration had to actually reinstate the dashboard and other daily CDC reporting requirements. And on Thursday, the nation's governors joined in a chorus of objections over the abruptness of the change to the reporting protocols for hospitals, asking that the administration actually delay the shift for 30 days at least. In a statement from the National Governors Association, uh, the hospital said they needed time to learn the new system as they continue to deal with the pandemic. The governors also urged the administration to keep the information publicly available. Now, lo and behold, out in the um, West Coast, I believe it's Washington, right now, okay, yesterday, today, they've got unmarked, unnamed federal people that are acting as law enforcement people. I don't know who they are. No one knows who they are hauling off protesters in unmarked vans. What tell us that all about? Is this Russia? Strange things are happening in this country right now. Now, there's still a push from the administration for schools to reopen with in-person classes, even as cases are spiking all over. There's no national guidance. And right now, one third of Florida students actually tested positive for COVID. And just hours ago, just hours ago, the White House, it's been reported, the White House is blocking the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Their director, Dr. Robert Redfield, and other officials from the agency from testifying before the House Education and uh, Labor Committee. And they're doing a hearing because they're trying to figure out what to do with the opening of the schools. Just as the debate of schools is saying, uh, starting to flare up all over the place, the White House is telling the director of the CDC and his staff they can't testify in front of Congress, in front of these two committees. Okay. Who restricts information? It's an amazing thing. Now, it's also election time right now. The president poll numbers are dropping everywhere you turn, even in many red states that he won by double digits in 2016. And that's happening as his niece, Mary Trump, with a doctorate in psychology, said he has a variety of psychological impairments, definitely narcissism, for which she says he meets all nine criteria, but probably other conditions also. She lists as possibilities any social personality disorder, dependent personality disorder, a learning disorder, and a sleep disorder, which she says in her book. Now, the President of the United States, in her opinion, struggles to control his impulses, tell the truth, learn new facts, apologize for mistakes, and lives in constant terror of having people perceive his flaws. Is she right? I don't know. She said she was traumatized by his 2016 election win and feared that her uncle was uniquely ill-qualified to govern in a time of crisis. She said Donald's pathologies are so complex and his behaviors so often inexplicable, inexplicable that coming up with an accurate and comprehensive diagnosis would require a full battery of psychological and neuropsychological tests that he'll never sit for. It's what she said. Direct quote from her. She wrote that book and she would hope that, you know, the idea that Trump de deploys strategies, okay, when people think about it, does he really deploy any tangible strategies or has a real agenda? Well, she says his only aim is to protect his own fragile ego and have others see him as strong and smart. And that really brings me to the question for today. It's Friday. Have you had enough? When you look at everything that goes on on a weekly and a monthly basis outside of your direct life, and then you add in all your personal job 
family, health, and financial situations and your personal dramas. Have you had enough? How does all this affect you? Are you stressed out? Headaches, stomach problems, maybe short tempered, snapping at people, angry more than you should be, not eating right, having restless, restless sleep when you can actually get any at all. Do you find yourself making poor decisions based on what's happening at the moment? Have you lost that guidance and control in your life? Did you ever really have it? Take some time for yourself. Disconnect from the world and the craziness and the noise. Disconnect from the Twitter and the Facebook, the email and the phone. Turn off the news and the podcasts. Spend some time with your mind. What do you want to accomplish in your life? What's the one or two big things that you actually want to do before you die? Write them down. Look at, look at that paper. Okay, look at what you wrote in the paper. How much, if any, of what you've been doing and subjecting yourself to with all the things that you do, the people you've been associating with, and the money you spend, how much, if any of it at all, is actually moving you closer to the one or two big things that you said you want to accomplish in your life? Moment of truth now. If not much of all that nonsense and crazy people and things that you've been helping or not helping you get to where you want to go, why are you doing them? If you're 50 plus, you've only got a very short window of time in your life to retire and do the things you actually want to do. You've only got a very short window of time to get control of your money and your life so you can do this one or two big things that you actually want to accomplish. Now, before people die, okay, they generally look back on their lives. Very few regret the things they've actually done. Most everyone regrets the things that they didn't do. Live your life without regrets. Use short window retirement planning so you can get control of your life, your money, and do the things that you want to do. Do those one or two big things. I'm Dr. Fred Rouse, the real money doctor. My only goal is to help you get, protect, and enjoy your money, your life, and your retirement. If you're really ready to actually take control of your life, your time, and your money, so that you can give yourself the option to retire the next three to five years with the cash flow that you'll need to maintain the lifestyle you want and do those one or two big things in your life without ever having to worry about money or a job again, go to my site, drrousenow.com. See if I can help. See if I can help you live your life without regrets. I appreciate spending some time with you today. I look forward to spending some more time with you on uh, Monday around 7 o'clock. Thank you.